Um, it's really interesting the fact that we're still talking about this 60 years on and we're still quite interested in this story, aren't we? Well, and I think rightly so. I mean, serial killers are very rare in Britain and Brady and Hindley are serial killers. But I think what really generates such uh, an interest in this case is just the depravity of what happened to those, those victims. And we know about that depravity because his, the penultimate victim was Leslie Ann Downey and then Edward Evans. Brady and Hindley recorded Leslie Ann Downey uh, as she was being killed, and that tape was available. So Brady and Hindley recorded Leslie Ann Downey uh, as she was being killed, and that tape was available. So it, it took you into the moment when Leslie would lose her life. In the quiet town of Manchester, England, a sinister evil was brewing between 1963 and 1965. In the heart of this working-class city, Two individuals, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, were about to embark on a chilling journey that would etch their names into the annals of criminal history. Hindley, a typist, met Brady, a man with a criminal past, in 1961. Despite his record of burglaries, she found herself drawn to Brady's dark allure. Their relationship was far from ordinary. Brady, fascinated by the Nazis, imbued their dates with a macabre flavor, taking Hindley to movies about the Nuremberg trials. Lunch breaks were spent reading about Nazi atrocities, a shared interest that only deepened their bond. Their fascination with violence and the grotesque was not confined to the pages of books or the silver screen. It was a fascination that they would soon bring to life in the most horrifying way imaginable. As their relationship grew, Hindley underwent a physical transformation to match their disturbing interests. She altered her appearance to mirror the Aryan ideal, bleaching her hair blonde and adorning her lips with dark red lipstick. This was more than a mere aesthetic change. It was a visual manifestation of the evil that was quietly brewing within her. The pair soon began to dream about committing crimes together. Initially, they fantasized about robberies, envisioning a life of wealth and luxury. But their dreams took a darker turn. They decided that murder was more their style, a decision that would soon plunge the city of Manchester into a nightmare of terror and bloodshed. Their shared obsession with violence and crime was about to take a horrifying turn. The quiet town of Manchester was on the brink of experiencing a brand of evil it had never known before, as Hindley and Brady prepared to unleash their reign of terror. Their names would soon become synonymous with horror, their actions a chilling testament to the darkness that can lurk within the human heart. Their shared obsession with violence and crime would soon take a horrifying turn. July 12, 1963, marked the beginning of their reign of terror. A day just like any other, it was on this fateful date that Ian Brady and Myra Hindley claimed their first victim, 16-year-old Pauline Reed. A regular teenager, Pauline had been on her way to a dance, her heart fluttering with the excitement that only such an evening can bring, but as fate would have it, she would never reach her destination. Myra Hindley, a woman who would later be dubbed as the most evil in Britain, spotted the unsuspecting Pauline. With a wily charm and a carefully crafted lie, Hindley lured Pauline into her car. The pretense, a lost glove, supposedly misplaced somewhere on the desolate Saddleworth Moor, a simple request for help, a ploy so innocent yet so deadly. Pauline, unsuspecting of the horrors that awaited her, agreed to help. They drove to the isolated moor, a good 15 miles outside Manchester. Once there, Hindley played the part of a distressed woman who had lost her expensive glove. She asked Pauline to help her search and the young girl, naive and kind-hearted, complied. It was here, amidst the tall swaying reeds of the moor, that Ian Brady, Hindley's lover, made his move. He led Pauline further into the wilderness, away from the road, away from any chance of escape. What transpired next was a horrifying act of cruelty and violence. Brady, a man with a criminal past and a heart devoid of empathy, sexually assaulted Pauline before slitting her throat. With their monstrous act complete, Brady and Hindley coldly buried Pauline's body on the desolate moor. The girl, who had set out that evening in her party dress and blue coat, excited for a night of dancing and laughter, was left alone in the cold, unforgiving ground of Saddleworth Moor. Pauline's body, still in her party dress and blue coat, wouldn't be found for another two decades. This marked the beginning of Brady and Hindley's reign of terror, a period that would go down in history as one of the darkest chapters of British crime. The murders did not stop at Pauline. Two more children would tragically fall prey to this malevolent duo. 
In the chillingly cold winter of 1963, 12-year-old John Kilbride became the next victim. Just like Pauline, John was lured by Hindley under the guise of a simple favor. A lost glove, a small errand that led to a nightmare on the isolated moors. Brady, lurking in the shadows, was ready to enact the sinister script they had woven. The following year in June, they struck again. This time, the victim was Keith Bennett, a boy of only 12. Keith was on his way to his grandmother's house when Hindley, with her deceptive charm, convinced him to help her find a glove she had lost on the moors. The glove, of course, didn't exist. It was a ruse, a chillingly calculated tactic to isolate their victims. Once they were far from the prying eyes of civilization, the true horror would begin. The children, innocent and unsuspecting, were led into the reeds by Brady. Here, far from help, they were subjected to unimaginable terror. Each child was sexually assaulted, their lives brutally extinguished by the man they had followed to help a seemingly harmless woman. And then, the moors, silent and remote, became the final resting place for these innocent lives. The bodies were hastily buried, hidden beneath the earth in this desolate landscape, a grim testament to the horrific acts perpetrated by Hindley and Brady. These were not random acts of violence, but meticulously planned and executed murders. The innocent trust of these children was exploited, their lives snuffed out in the most horrific manner imaginable. Each act was a chilling testament to the depths of depravity that human beings can sink to. As the chilling saga unfolded, the isolated moors, once a symbol of serene solitude, were transformed into a macabre gravesite. The landscape bore silent witness to the monstrous acts committed by Hindley and Brady. The isolated moors became their gruesome burial ground. December 1964 witnessed the most horrifying act committed by Hindley and Brady. The chill of winter was not the only thing that cast an eerie shadow over Manchester that year. A 10-year-old girl named Leslie Ann Downey became the next target of the malevolent duo. The innocent child was at a fair, immersed in the joy and laughter that such places bring. But her happiness was snatched away when Hindley and Brady found her alone. They spun a web of deceit, convincing the unsuspecting girl to help them unload groceries from their car. A simple act of kindness turned into a trap as they led her to a house that Hindley's grandmother owned. Once inside, the true horror unfolded. Leslie was stripped of her clothing, gagged, and bound. The child's fear was palpable as she was forced to pose for photographs. In a chilling act of cruelty, Hindley and Brady recorded 13 minutes of Leslie's terrified pleas for help. The tape would later serve as a ghastly testament to the horror the child had endured. Ian Brady, with no semblance of humanity left in him, then assaulted and strangled the young girl, the life of an innocent child, full of potential and promise, was extinguished in the most brutal way possible. Leslie's body was later found buried on the Saddleworth Moor, another tragic addition to the grim graveyard the couple had created. The recording of Leslie's pleas for help remains one of the most haunting pieces of evidence in British criminal history. It's a chilling reminder of the depths of depravity that humans can sink to. This act, among others, cemented Hindley and Brady's place as two of the most reviled figures in British history. Leslie's murder marked a horrifying peak in the couple's reign of terror. This was not just a murder, it was a deeply disturbing act that shook the nation to its core. The sheer inhumanity of it all left an indelible mark, a chilling reminder of the darkness that can lurk within seemingly ordinary people. By 1965, the police were closing in on Hindley and Brady. Their monstrous spree had claimed the lives of four innocent children, but their fifth and final victim would ultimately lead to their downfall. Edward Evans was a 17-year-old apprentice engineer, unsuspecting of the fate that awaited him. On the night of October 6th, they lured Edward into their vehicle under the pretense of a casual ride. The destination, however, was not his home, but their house of horrors. The couple had a sinister plan in motion, but this time, they were not alone. David Smith, Myra Hindley's brother-in-law, was present in the house that night. Smith was initially under the impression that it was all a sick joke, but the reality soon dawned upon him when he witnessed Brady attacking Edward with an axe. The brutality of the scene was horrifying, and the sight of Edward's lifeless body left Smith in a state of shock. The following day, Smith, shaken by the events of the previous night, reported the incident to the police. The authorities arrived at the couple's residence, where the they found Edward's body wrapped in plastic sheets. Brady was arrested on suspicion of murder, 
while Hindley feigned ignorance of the gruesome act. The police launched a thorough investigation during which they discovered a left luggage ticket for Manchester Central Station in Hindley's prayer book. This led them to a pair of suitcases which contained shocking evidence linking the couple to the murders of Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride. The suitcases held photographs, tape recordings, and other incriminating items that left no room for doubt. With the discovery of this chilling evidence, Hindley was also taken into custody. The couple's horrifying spree of sexual assault and murder had finally come to an end. They were charged with multiple counts of murder and were subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment. Their reign of terror had come to an end, but the horror of their crimes lived on. The trial of Hindley and Brady shocked the nation. As the full extent of their monstrous deeds came to light, the public recoiled in horror. The courtroom filled with the hushed whispers of onlookers came to a standstill as the gruesome details were laid bare. The chilling tape recordings, the heartbreaking pleas of the young victims, and the cold, remorseless demeanors of the killers left a lasting impression on everyone present. The trial was marked by the couple's lack of remorse, their defiance adding another layer of horror to the already gruesome narrative. Hindley and Brady were each sentenced to life imprisonment, a punishment that many felt was too lenient for the magnitude of their crimes. The verdict sparked outrage across the nation, prompting a public debate about the death penalty, which had been abolished just a year before their trial. The aftermath of the trial was marred by a grim reality. Not all the bodies of the slain children had been found. Despite repeated searches of Saddleworth Moor, the final resting place of Keith Bennett remains a mystery to this day. The inability to bring closure to all the victims' families only deepened the national sorrow and anger towards Hindley and Brady. Life in prison for the duo was far from easy. Regarded as the most hated couple in Britain, they were the target of numerous attacks from other inmates. Brady was declared criminally insane in 1985 and was transferred to a high-security hospital. Hindley, on the other hand, spent the rest of her life behind bars, maintaining till her last breath that Brady had manipulated her into participating in the murders. In the years following their capture, the story of the Moore's murderers became a grim part of British folklore, a chilling reminder of the depths to which humanity can sink. The legacy of the Moore's murders serves as a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity. Despite their convictions, many questions remain unanswered. The Moore's murders, a grim chapter in British history, have left behind a trail of unresolved mysteries. One of the most prominent among these revolves around Myra Hindley's role in the heinous crimes. Hindley's assertions that she was manipulated by Ian Brady into participating in these horrific acts have sparked widespread debate. Was she a willing accomplice, or was she another victim of Brady's malevolent influence? Hindley claimed that Brady had an overpowering hold over her, asserting that she was trapped in a cycle of abuse and manipulation. However, many, including the families of the victims, find it hard to accept this narrative. They view Hindley as a ruthless instigator, not a reluctant participant in the chilling crimes. The evidence paints a complex picture. On one hand, Hindley's transformation to fit Brady's Aryan ideal, her active role in luring the victims and her participation in the murders suggest complicity. On the other hand, Brady's fascination with Nazi ideology, his criminal past and his evident control over Hindley hint at the possibility of coercion. Yet the truth remains elusive, buried beneath layers of deception and denial. Another haunting question concerns the whereabouts of the remaining bodies. Despite extensive searches across Saddleworth Moor, some of the victims have never been found. The untiring efforts of the police, volunteers, and even the victims' families have been met with the unforgiving silence of the Moor. The absence of closure for these families adds another layer of tragedy to the already horrifying tale. As the years roll on, the quest for answers continues. Hindley's claims, Brady's silence, the missing bodies, each element adds to the enigma of the Moor's murders. The chilling acts of Hindley and Brady, their twisted relationship, and the unresolved mysteries surrounding their crimes continue to captivate and horrify in equal measure. The Moore's murders continue to haunt the collective memory, a chilling testament to the monstrous acts of Hindley and Brady.
someplace later and would lose her life. And then, of course, with Edward Evans, there's a witness to the murder itself, Myra Hindley's brother-in-law, David Smith, and Smith is a whistleblower, effectively, and describes to the police how Edward lost his life. And it was because of that, I think, initially, just because the, the crimes themselves were so sadistic, so gruesome, and one heard a victim pleading for her life that made the case really stand out. And it's a people. living memory for so many people, I think, isn't it? Oh, case, absolutely. Isn't it? I mean, this was one of the th defining moments of the 60s. Yeah. Can I just ask, do you think that was their, their downfall in introducing the, the brother-in-law into the situation? Because, obviously, they'd gotten away with it before. It was David Smith. You know, David Smith brings all of uh, Moore's murders to an end because he blows the whistle. And he's brought into the murders because Ian Brady thought of himself as this cool, sophisticated... He wanted to be a bank robber. He was anti-authoritarian. And seemingly, he was trying to groom David Smith to join him on their bank robberies. Um, and, of course, uh, Ian Brady was never a bank robber. He murdered children but it was David Smith blowing the whistle that brings everything to an end. So what, did he witness the murder and then... And then sort of, did he make his excuses or something and then rang the police, or...? It, what happened was that he was there as Edward Evans was being murdered by Brady, being hit over the head, um, brutally, time after time, and then he... Because he feared for his own life, he had to help with cleaning the oh front goodness. room up, oh, and gosh. then he made his excuses, got away, went to a public phone box and reported what had happened. And that really is the beginning of the end. And it was really controversial at the time, because I can remember they got rid of hanging a year before, then they went to trial. So the, they were in quite a lot of danger, weren't they, when they went to trial? Oh, they, were, they, were, they had death threats. The police were all... It was Chester uh, Crown Court. April 1966, uh, they, Brady and Hidley had to give their evidence behind bulletproof glass. Um, hanging had been abolished in 1965. The last people who had actually been hanged had been in 1964. And so the public were going, look at how appalling these crimes are, yeah. and we've just abolished hanging. So, of course, that adds to that layer of why we're still interested in the case, because it's about the swinging 60s, mm. it's about, you know, is our culture changing irrevocably? How, how should we react to those changes? The tape fascinates me. I mean, what, is that just pure narcissism, do you think? I think it's pure psychopathy. Narcissism is part of the psychopathic personality disorder. And Brady, of course, it, it, without any doubt, you know, psychopathy is a much overused label, but without doubt, Ian Brady was a psychopath. He showed no empathy. He couldn't walk in another person's shoes. He wanted to record uh, Leslie Ann Downey being murdered because he...